Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. This is Reality Asserts Itself. Is it the responsibility of free people to do something, to take steps to deal with such a threat before such an attack occurs? Yes, Mr. Rumsfeld, I think we need weapons inspections, not war. Why are you obstructing the inspections? Is this really about oil? How many Mr. civilians will be killed? Mr. Secretary, would you suspend uh, for a minute and... Uh, if really we, about oil? Why is it if we could ask the staff to uh, see to it that our guests are escorted. Have a nice day, Mr. Secretary. We'll uh, be with you in a minute. Thank you, ladies. So that was Medea Benjamin after the founding of Code Pink, uh, having one or two things to say to Donald Rumsfeld. Now, joining us in the studio again is Medea Benjamin. Thanks for joining us again. Good to be here. So, Medea is co founder of Code Pink with Jody Evans, and she's the author of the book Drone Warfare Killing by Remote Control. So talk a bit about what inspired uh, and, and the early days of Code Pink. It was after 9-11, and uh, as the whole country was in mourning, uh, so was I. I, have, I grew up in New York, have a lot of family there. Um, but I saw as the days went by what direction this was going in, and that was going to be more killing of more people, more innocent people dying. And at the time uh, when it was being talked about invading Afghanistan, I reached out to the Afghan community. I was living in San Francisco, and there's a big Afghan community in Hayward there. And we organized a, a beautiful event with about 1,000 people coming together to say no to violence. And uh, then uh, Bush went ahead and invaded Afghanistan. I went to Afghanistan a week after the invasion, uh, saw that uh, the story that was being told to the Americans was not true, that we were killing a lot of innocent people in our, uh, in our invasion, and came back to the US, tried to go to Washington and hold a press conference and say, why in the world, when we're mourning the lives of innocent people, are we killing more innocent people? and nobody wanted to listen to it. Now, I made a film in Afghanistan in, in the uh, spring of 2002, and while there was certainly significant resentment about the kind of civilian deaths, and, and a lot of the American bombings seemed to be, at, at a, there's a certain point where the Northern Alliance was kind of sitting north of Kabul, and the Americans hadn't quite decided whether they're gonna let them come in or not, and they're just bombing anything so they could look like they were still bombing. But on the other hand, I found most people I talked to were so furious at the Taliban, so didn't want to live under that regime, that they were more, I should say, accepting of the American overthrow of the Taliban. I think, you know, they, were, you know, they thought something positive would come out of all this, other than years of, of, of war. Uh, but at the time, I, I don't think it can be underestimated how much people wanted the Taliban gone. Well, yes. On the other hand, I think that what was concerning to me was people who were part of the collateral damage, who weren't being acknowledged anymore. And if we allowed that to keep happening, uh, it would keep happening. And so what we did is brought people from uh, who had direct family members killed on 9-11, brought them to Afghanistan, took them back to meet with their counterparts, which uh, there were many, unfortunately. And they would say, uh, yes, we hated the Taliban, uh, but what did I have to do with that? And why was my family hurt? 
And why won't the U.S. government apologize for what they did to my family? And now how am I going to feed my kids? And my husband's gone. And so we did a campaign to get uh, a, a compensation for innocent victims. And it was actually ended up, after a couple of years, being a successful campaign. The first pot of money was a $40 million fund uh, in the name of one of the women that uh, we worked with, Marla Ruzica, uh, to compensate innocent family and this, victims. And this was all under the roof of Code Pink? This was before, uh, we, it started before Code Pink, mm -hmm. uh, when we uh, had a group of women that gathered, actually it was gathering around women concerned about the environment, was when we had already invaded Afghanistan and there was talk about invading Iraq. And at that point we were saying, how can we allow the U.S. to go in and invade another country, this one that really had nothing to do with 9-11, we've got to do something about it. And that's when some of us were playing around with this color-coded alert system of George Bush. Remember, he had the, the yellow, orange, red. Uh, and we said that that was a very insidious thing, actually, because it was making people feel uh, living in fear and that it was justifying uh, more military intervention. And so we came up with this idea of Code Pink, almost kind of a lark. And we thought maybe we'd go to Washington, D.C., do some action, and then go back to our other work, because we were all very involved in other things. Uh, but it didn't work out that way. No, Code Pink has become one of the most known uh, organizations on the left, uh, as I said in one of the earlier segments, uh, you know, one of the favorite targets uh, on the list of, of evildoers of Glenn Beck, you're usually on, on the list there. Uh, but but uh, there's so much we can talk about in terms of the history of Code Pink and, and this whole era, and, and, and I don't think we're going to get into all of it now. So I want to kind of focus on one thing, which is in the lead up to the Iraq War, there was a massive upsurge in opposition to the war. Tens of thousands of people hit the streets all across the United States. You know, in the end, millions of people around the world. Um, but what happened to that movement? Uh, you know, there's some, some people suggest, uh, although I don't think it's directly time, but there's a suggestion that there's a, you, know, you can get the anti-war movement going in the United States when it's against the Republicans. But once the Democrats are in power, you know, it takes the steam out of it. It wasn't so true under Vietnam, but other issues because of the draft and such. But in short, what happened to that upsurge? Well, you said it. It's a one-word answer, Obama. Uh, and it wasn't uh, Obama getting in. It was the lead-up. It was the campaigning for Obama when people were so desperate for an, an alternative to Bush that they said, I'm going to throw myself into this. I'm going to take off of work, students taking off semesters. I'm going to put my life into getting this guy elected who said he was against the war in Iraq. And we put all our hopes and dreams into Obama, thinking that because he was against the war in Iraq and because he said uh, Afghanistan was a good war, he didn't really mean that. You know, he was just saying that to get elected, but he was a smart guy and he understood that war was not the answer and he was going to get us out. And so the steam was just taken out of the whole movement. And it was amazing to see because um, you said tens of thousands. I mean, there were eight times during the Bush years that we got out over 100,000 people. And we had a huge movement. You just look at one group like Code Pink. We came out of nowhere and suddenly we had over 300,000 people on our mailing list. And we had over 300 groups around the country and really around the world. We weren't even trying to set up chapters, and they were just springing up uh, on university campuses, small towns, big towns, everywhere. Um, when Obama's started to gain steam as a candidate, those started uh, fizzling out. And when he won the election, we had half the numbers of people we had before uh, on our mailing list, and most of the groups started to disintegrate. So did, did, that was indicative of what was happening to the whole peace movement. And had you drunk any of the Kool-Aid yourself? I drank the Kool-Aid myself in the sense that I uh, voted for Obama the first time around, and I'm usually a Green Party voter, or always voting for something other than the Democrats and Republicans. Um, I drank the Kool-Aid in that I was very, very anxious to uh, vote for somebody who is going to win and have somebody who is going to be an alternative to those eight horrible years of Bush. 
and um, and I was. Uh, we immediately did up a list of Obama's promises that went from, you know, getting out of uh, uh, the war in Iraq to closing down Guantanamo and other things. And um, we started out right away, Obama, keep your promise. And I physically moved from San Francisco, where I've been living for 26 years, to Washington, D.C. to say, now is the time to be there to make sure Obama fulfills his promises like closing Guantanamo, getting out of Iraq. And uh, so I was full of hope, I would say. Yeah. Now, if you actually read the speeches, and, and we covered this on The Real News, I mean, I have to say, we didn't ever drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, and Because we actually used to read his speeches. In fact, the, the best thing to do with Obama is don't listen to him, because he sells the speeches usually so well. <laughs> but if you actually read them, <laughs> yeah. you would come to a different conclusion. And in and, and the interviews he did about the Iraq war, it was always, this is just stupid. I'm not a pacifist. This, the Iraq war is a stupid war, but he certainly was, uh, in fact, what was stupid about it is he said it weakened America's ability to project power around the globe, but he certainly believed in projecting power around the globe. Well, you're smarter perhaps, and perhaps it's because- Maybe because I'm Canadian. Well, and maybe it's because you're not an activist because we were just so desperate. You know, we saw uh, firsthand so much of the devastation of the Bush years. Uh, the choice was between Hillary and Obama in terms of who was going to win from the Democratic side. And we knew o Hillary was a hawk. In fact, we had a campaign uh, bird-dogging Hillary everywhere she went. And so our only real option for somebody who was going to win was Obama. And we projected our hopes and dreams on him like so many others did. And I remember, you know, you selectively listen. And I selectively listened to a lot of his campaign uh, rhetoric and also to the uh, debates. And I remember one debate when he said that the role of a good leader is to talk to our adversaries and I will talk to our adversaries. And he got huge uh, applause for that. And so I thought, all right, here's a guy who really understands that talking, dialogue, negotiations uh, are much better than more. And I have to say, it's the one thing I had hoped for in, 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 in 08 with Obama. And I didn't have a lot of high expectations, and I wasn't disillusioned because I didn't have a, much illusions. But I thought he'd be rational on Iran when it was clear McCain wouldn't be, and then after that it was clear Romney wouldn't be. And actually, so far, it looks like it is. I mean, from the point of view of the same thing, he wants to project American power, and he knows Iran you know, is, is stupid, even from the point of view of empire building. But I don't think you would get that from, from the Republican side. They, they, they seem much more willing to want to go for that kind of a fight. So I actually give him that. I think there is a rationality there. Well, that you know, jumps us fast forward until today, and I'm not sure if that's where you want to go. Know. We but, can jump around. Yeah. It's okay. We're okay, but I'm uh, amazed at the fact that after 12 years of war, um, Obama would be so stupid as to do the thing with Syria and say, oh, here's my red line, and actually even contemplate U.S. physical military involvement in Syria. And that was one of my most exciting moments as an anti-war activist in recent years was to see this spontaneous uprising from left, right, Republicans, Democrats, libertarians, you name it, saying, no way. And I think that you could say, yeah, Obama wants to have a rational uh, approach to Iran, but I also think it's the mood of the country right now and that it's forcing Obama to untether himself so much from AIPAC, the lobbyists that are, were gunning for uh, war in Syria and Iran, uh, and to take a more rational approach. I think it's a reflection of where we are as a nation, and I think there are a number of Republicans, and some of them are Tea Party Republicans, who really do not want to see the U.S. involved in another war. Uh, I think that's true, and, but if you go back to the Iraq war, there are a lot of people against the Iraq war, and it happens anyway. Um, I, I think it but that wasn't under Obama. That no, was but under I'm saying, Bush. Yeah, yeah, but it's not just about public pressure. What I'm but saying I, is, I think that Obama is more sensitive to public pressure than Bush was. Yeah. Uh, my, my butt, and it's his own party. My, yeah, my butt is, is he was saying, I, I think this is hilarious, me defending Obama, because if you <laughs> watch the real news, we spend most of our time rather critical. But in, in the debates in 08, or you know, leading into 08, um, he was saying things like, if you didn't want Iran 
to become such a dominant power in the region, you shouldn't have overthrown Saddam Hussein. Uh, you know, he was giving rational arguments back then. But, but, but I, I guess what I'm really getting at here, and this ties together with the anti-war movement question, it's not about him. He represents a section of the American elite. He's, he represents uh, probably the predominant opinion of the American professional foreign policy establishment. He represents the more professional Pentagon establishment. And all of them, in, you know, when they look at their grand chessboard, a war with Iran's not in American interest. And, and uh, the same people were actually opposed to the war in Iraq on the whole, um, but Bush wouldn't listen to them. Um, but what I'm getting at is that, that, that when, when you drink the Kool-Aid, somehow you have to say to yourself that it's not a class that's in power. It's not a section of the American elite that's in power. It's like this guy, Obama. And if you start thinking that, then you can project things into this guy as an individual. But he never could have gotten where he was if he didn't represent a whole section of the American elite. And that section of the American elite seems awfully good at taking the legs out of whether it's the anti-war movement or whether it was the upsurge in Wisconsin of kind of turning the movement to become an appendage of the Democratic Party. So well, exactly right. And that's, you know, when I made the decision to come to Washington, it wasn't because I thought Obama was just going to follow this nice anti-war path. I knew he was going to be confronted with uh, this tremendous military industrial complex that was going to push him on the, the, the militaristic path and that we had to keep the momentum up. And we turned around as Code Pink and said, you know, where are our forces? Well, our forces had dwindled away, as we said, and even then looking at Congress, at the people that we had worked so much with under, uh, under the Bush years, um, the Progressive Caucus, it was hard to get them to speak out, to say anything. And that's been tremendous frustration over these years, is to see that uh, the people who we were uh, allied with and working closely with under the Bush years uh, had suddenly either they were part of the Democratic establishment and they were going to go with their guy, or um, they were uh, willing to let down their guard and waited now for years uh, for Obama to do the right thing. So I don't want to, I mean, when I say I drank Kool-Aid, I drank the Kool-Aid excited that things were going to change under Obama, but I was assuming that we were going to still have a movement, which we didn't have. Mm. The, uh, f one of the first things Obama did is not charge Bush and Cheney. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of talk about charging him, uh, charging them on torture issues, but I always thought if you're going to charge him, it should have been on uh, war crimes of launching an illegal war with which hundreds of thousands of people died. And, and uh, totally, and to this day, we at Code Pink are one of the few who follow these guys around, whether it's on a book tour or they're in a speaking engagement. We try to go whenever we can and bust into the room and saying, arrest that guy for war crimes, because we don't forget. And, and clearly, President Obama, and, and for those of you that are going to write in the comment section, oh, there's Paul defending Obama on Iran. <laughs> uh, I, I only say this from the point of view of clearly it's, it's, it's to strengthen the empire. He doesn't want to get embroiled in Iran, but he has no problem. We're going to talk more about drones and such later. He clearly has no problem launching wars in the defense of that empire. Yeah, and killing a lot of innocent people. In so you were in touch with large numbers of people when at the height of the movement and when Code Pink was, you know, had lots of forces. What do they say? How can they, at least by this point, not get that Obama is essentially continuing Bush-Cheney policies? Well, in the first years of Obama, uh, people got very angry at us and say, how could you be criticizing Obama? Uh, how could you be protesting what Obama is doing? And so we lost a lot of people from that end of things. It's funny because some of the people from the right who hated us so much under the Bush years well, were saying, well, at least we have to give them credit that there's sort of equal opportunity protesters. Um, but we were small because we had lost so many people. And then over the years, we've started to grow again uh, because people have seen that Obama is just uh, continuing so many of the policies of the, of the Bush administration. And sure, there are people who, lots of people, who will continue to defend Obama's foreign policy and try to make it as very differentiated from the Bush years. 
but we don't do that. And uh, we would love to have the numbers that we had under the Bush administration. We don't have that, so we've tried to compensate uh, through doing th different things, like going into press conferences and speaking out when you know the national media is already there. But we certainly and unfortunately can't get uh, tens of thousands of people out anymore. We're lucky if we can get a thousand people out. Uh, I mean, part of it is the complexity of the situation is that, uh, you know, as much as one can critique Obama and his administration and his section of the elite, and I keep saying it that way because I don't want it to be about this one guy because it, it, it clearly isn't. Um, that being said, the other section of the elite, the far right of the elite, are, are, are thoroughly sociopathic, not to say you know, anyone that can you know, send drones doesn't have a good dose of sociopathy th themselves. But the other, you know, it's very likely, I would think, that if, if it had been a President Romney, for example, it, we might have been more directly heading towards war with Iran. And, and that's still not, quote unquote, off the table with, with the Obama administration, not to have illusions about them, but right now we don't seem to be headed there. Um, uh, you know, McCain, his, his war, he wanted to have a, a new Cold War with Russia. Who knows what, what the hell he would have started uh, in terms of uh, provocations against, against Russia. So, so it's complicated because it's, it's, it's not that there's no difference between these two sections. Right. And I think it's very interesting to see Kerry and how he has uh, been acting as Secretary of State. I was recently in Geneva when the uh, talks around Syria started. And on the one hand, it's kind of schizophrenic because you see um, him with the foreign minister of, uh, uh, of Russia and shaking hands and trying to show to the media that we're good friends and they actually are working together to, uh, for the, the Syria talks. On the other hand, it's that American arrogance that, you know, we will not contemplate any future of Syria that includes Saddam Hussein. Well, is that up to you, John Kerry, or is that up to the Syrian people? and the U.S. continuing to be uh, funding the rebels while they are uh, organizing these peace talks. So um, it's, uh, it's... And the Russians doing the same thing on the And the side. Russians doing the same thing. So and, 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 and the other thing about this whole thing is the absolute, uh, what's the word, marginalization, ignoring the refugee crisis in Syria, which is on a, you know, apocalyptic levels. And both in terms of the media and the politicians, it's like, oh, just to, oh, yes, there's some a, refugees. A couple of uh, million refugees, that's right. And the other thing ignoring is civil society, ignoring we were there to push women being at the table, women who had not taken up arms on either side, but who had huge constituencies because they were working with refugees. They were working with displaced people. They were risking their lives to try to get humanitarian aid to people. Uh, and uh, we could not get any kind of formal representation for women at these talks. So you have peace talks uh, where the guys with the guns are sitting around a table and barely even talking to each other. They're only talking through the UN envoy. Uh, and the peacemakers are not at the table. And it was very um, profound to be there with many of these Syrian women who had been trying for months uh, to get their voices heard and ignored at all levels from the US, the Russian side, and the UN side. Okay, we're gonna do one more segment. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the American anti-war movement and uh, its ups and downs. Please join us with Medea Benjamin on Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News. <laughs> 